Good morning. I'm Pastor Doug, and welcome to Wesley Church's morning worship service. Today we are joining United Methodist Churches across the Susquehanna Conference for a shared worship service. I'm grateful to Bishop Park and the Cabinet for this gift of Sabbath for the pastors and the worship leaders of our conference. Today we're going to be blessed by the musicians from Elm Park United Methodist Church as they lead our music, and you will hear the Reverend Judy Walker, the scranton Wilkesbury District Superintendent, bring our morning message. Reverend Walker is looking at one of my favorite scripture passages as Jesus appears to his disciples and Thomas encounters our risen Lord. I have a few announcements to share with you before our service begins. The adult Sunday school class begins a new study this week. Jeff Miller will be leading the study on Max Licato's book, Before Amen. This study helps us learn to pray better, stronger, and with more fire, faith, and fervency by teaching us to do three things, to distill prayers in the Bible down to one pocket-sized prayer, to remember that the Good Shepherd has authority over your life, and to learn that prayer is simply a heartfelt conversation between God and his child. There are two copies of this easy-to-read book available in the church office for those wishing to join in this study via Zoom. Please contact Jeff Miller or Christopher Albright to be included in the online contact list for the class. All are welcome. We will resume our in-person worship on April 18th in the sanctuary and will also continue to live stream our service. For all in-person services, please contact the church office by phone or email to reserve your place. Wesley Preschool is partnering with Duck Donuts in Mechanicsburg for a fundraiser on April 18th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Who doesn't love a donut? So stop by Duck Donuts on Carlisle Pike to help out the preschool. Wesley Vacation Bible School will be held July 18th through the 22nd. We are currently building our leadership team. If you are able to help, please contact Amy Whitworth. My friends, come. Now is the time to worship.
Welcome to worship, people of God. Please join us in the greeting. Open your hearts, calm your thoughts, and look toward the Lord. God is drawing near us. Jesus invites us to bring him our burdens, for he will give us rest. We go to Jesus, trusting in his love and renewed by his resurrection. Please join us in praising God in the hymn, Ye Servants of God. Join me in prayer. Our God, who sent Jesus to live, die, and rise among us, we humbly thank you for letting us share in Christ's dying and rising. Jesus carried to the cross our wounds and pain with his own, and with him we are transformed and receive new life. Guide us to use that life in Christ to bring your grace healing, and hope to others. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Even as we continue to joy, rejoice in Jesus' resurrection, we admit that we have sometimes failed to practice the compassion and humility that Christ taught us. We confess that we have not always loved God with our whole hearts, and we have rejected, overlooked, or condemned our neighbors. When we humbly ask God for forgiveness and vow to change, God compassionately hears us. The good news is that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. We are forgiven. Glory to God. May Christ's peace embrace you and may you share that peace and forgiveness with others. Hear these words from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Our next musical offering is Jesus Paid It All by Matt Bloom on trumpet and Peter Yuritz on piano.
Hear the good news from the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, on the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet who have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but they are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Friends, across the connection, I am grateful to share with you in this time of worship I bring greetings from the bishop and the cabinet, and I want to thank Reverend Victoria Rebeck, our Susquehanna Conference Director of Connecting Ministries, for collaborating on this time of worship and providing the liturgy for today. I also give thanks for those who are participating today and for those of you joining us and offering this time of Sabbath rest for your pastors. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. We pray our hearts and minds will be open this day to hear what it is that will move us and draw us closer to you and closer to one another. Amen. So, I have an apology and a confession to make right from the get-go. First, an apology to my own doctor and to all of those in the medical profession for whom I have the highest regard and respect, particularly all of those who have been working the front lines tirelessly and sacrificially over this past year. Second, a confession. If I'm not feeling well or I have an ache somewhere, Before I call you, my beloved doctor, I check out WebMD. Yes, if I have a pain in the side of my knee, I Google pain in the side of my knee to see what WebMD or another Google medical source tells me what could possibly be the cause. Now, I know this isn't good practice, So I don't recommend it. You know, it comes with that warning, don't do this at home. But, but I had to return to WebMD searches today as I explored today's scriptures. Now, in the past, when I've preached on this scripture, focusing on Thomas, on doubt and belief and the fine line that separates the two, Sometimes I've preached on the peace that Jesus brings in the midst of fear. I've preached on Jesus breathing out the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. But today, 
I'm drawn to Jesus and the wounds inflicted upon him by the crucifixion. The scarring still freshly evident from those wounds and the intimate invitation to Thomas to touch. So, turning to WebMD, I wanted to find out more about wounds and scars. Wounds, I found, are injuries to living tissues. They can include cuts and scrapes and scratches and punctures in the skin. When we or someone else touch a wound, there's that natural hurt and that involuntary reaction to pull back. Wounds without proper treatment can begin to fester and spread, and if not treated properly, can become deadly. Scars are a natural part of the body's healing process. A scar results from the biologic process of wound repair in the skin and other tissues. Most wounds, except for very minor ones, result in some degree of scarring. So again, my apologies to those who can offer much better medical explanations. But from what I understand, wounds are injuries that are still unhealed. Scars develop from wounds that are in the process of healing or have healed. And we also know that not all wounds are physical. It's the physical wounds that are often the easiest to see. But wounds in our souls are often raw and unhealed too. Something has happened that has cut deep into our mind or our emotions or our spirit. These wounds also, if untreated, can fester and spread and become deadly. But these deep wounds can also be healed too. Even though not seen, they still leave scars. Scars remind us of the wounds in our lives. And I believe every scar tells a story. Jesus had scars, the marks of nails in his hand, a spear in his side. As we heard in the gospel on the very evening of Christ's resurrection, the risen Lord appeared to the disciples and after greeting them with peace, showed them his scars. Notice that before his appearance, the disciples were hunkered down in fear together behind locked doors. Yet, once they saw his hands and side, a transformation occurred and they began to rejoice. Likewise, Thomas, upon touching the marks, the scars, replied with what many theologians describe as the central truth of this gospel. As Thomas declared, my Lord and my God. God fully revealed in Christ. How ironic that seeing and touching scars which were produced by pain provided such joy and hope. Just three days before, those scars were deep wounds that were on full display, inflicted by the ravages of what religion and empire can do to a body. His forehead lacerated from the thorns, his back shredded from scourging, his hands and feet impaled by the nails, his abdomen carved open by the spear. It is these very wounds that remind us that we can't just skip from Palm Sunday to Easter. The wounds Jesus suffered remind us of the dark days in between and the suffering that Jesus went through out of God's love for the world 
to offer redemption from the sin that wounds. Jesus must have felt deep pain. And through his resulting resurrection and scars, we are able to feel deep redemption. We are able to feel hope and renewal, and yes, we are called to rejoice. Richard Hayes, New Testament scholar and professor emeritus of the New Testament at Duke Divinity, commented on this scripture from today. He wrote an article called Fingering the Evidence. He writes, isn't it curious that God could raise Jesus from the dead, but didn't heal the nail wounds in his hands? Was this an oversight? Surely not. The power of death is conquered, but the scars remain. My friends, think about this. The risen Christ. The risen, living Christ identifies himself to his disciples by his scars. It is because Christ overcame the agonizing wounds and death of crucifixion by his resurrection that the disciples were able to see and touch his scars and why we today are able to triumphantly proclaim that we are Easter people. Yet Jesus also knew that there were other wounds in that room that night, wounds that were invisible to the human eye, wounds that were suppressing faith and stifling hope and paralyzing the very people who were called to carry his message into the world. The shock and fear and grief that held them in captivity had left wounds on their souls. How did he deal with those wounds? He showed them his own. He showed them the wounds that were left in place, forming healing scars. They were scars of hope signifying God's power to transform those wounds into new life. The story of Easter and the resurrection of Christ has the power to turn our wounds into scars of hope. Every scar tells a story. If you've read any of the Harry Potter books, you know that Harry has a visible scar on his forehead that bears testimony to the loss of his parents at a tender age. It's part of his identity. It also gives him occasional insight, an insight into the mind and suffering of others, including the mind of the one who must not be named. Somehow, Somehow I've gotten through almost 65 years of life without any physical scars, other than a few scratches from some of my beloved pets. My scars are invisible, not able to be seen by the human eye. Scars that remind me of past woundedness, but have also served to ease the pain of others in similar situations as I share the redemptive work of Christ's healing in my own life. Photographer Peter Scular created a story for the CBS News through a portrait session that brought to light the journey of five people and the stories of their scars. He hoped that by understanding others' stories, it would unite, invite compassion, and bring healing to others. One of the photo sessions was with a man named Tyler. Tyler shares his story and says that his scars started appearing when he was around 24 years old and continued into his early 30s. He received them all through self-infliction, self-harm. 
He was going through a rough patch in life, had been undiagnosed for bipolar one disorder and just felt very lost and not in control. He finally began a path to understanding the whys behind his actions through the assistance of a clinical psychologist. And in his mid-30s, gained more knowledge about himself and who he was than he had in his first 30 years of life. He has not inflicted self-harm since. For several years, Tyler said that he was shy and and reluctant to have anyone see the scars. He said he didn't have to want to explain where they came from until he really understood the why himself. He says he eventually became more comfortable with his body and, and having people see the results of his actions. Tyler said he was, he was a bit surprised at the response because his friends started opening up to him about their struggles. So it empowered him to want to learn even more so that he could be better equipped to help others. Sisters and brothers, what scars do you bear? You can probably name your physical scars in some sort of chronological order. Some scars bear witness to those ways that we've given life to others. Some scars tell us that we've been wounded, those physical scars. But then some of us, carry those invisible scars that remind us of our survival, of our history, that remind us of even belonging. Every scar tells a story. Jesus got his scars because he embodied the reign of God, when he brought good news to the poor, gave sight to the blind, freedom to the captives, and challenged economic, political, and religious oppression and servitude. But Jesus' scars weren't private. They were shared. And if we look closely at scripture, we'll see that it was Jesus who initially offered to reveal his scars to the disciples. It was Jesus who invited Thomas to touch the physical consequence of injustice, of violence, of the silence and the desertion of friends. Our own personal scars can have a positive effect both on our family and our community. We need to talk about our scars, to talk about how we overcame the wounds they represented. It can mean the world to those who are in the grip of doubt and fear and perceived helplessness. You know, we spend an enormous amount of time in our culture protecting ourselves from suffering and loss. We don't want to have to learn from our wounds and subsequent scars. We just want the suffering to not be able to be seen and to just go away. But to not know suffering and loss negates the truth of the gospel. Jesus' vision of a just world was met with rejection and violence. We cannot avoid suffering. We have wounds. And we will inflict wounds. There are deep wounds in our society. The scourge of racism the blight of COVID, the destruction of creation, the inequities of greed, suffering in all forms, all suffering that needs to see the scars of our wounded healer. There are deep scars in the lives of people all around us that need to hear the stories of our woundedness, to know the hope that comes with scars. The resurrection, 
doesn't allow us to sit with wounds festering or with hearts broken, or with lives despairing. The resurrection pulls us forward out of our woundedness and into the light and new life that God wants for us, scars and all. Reverend Brian Coombs of Haywood Street, a United Methodist Mission Congregation in Asheville, North Carolina, said, the power of the resurrection isn't that our scars disappear, but rather that we all finally have the courage to show them. Each one of us will show our scars in different ways and different places. But our best moments will likely come from those places where we have been scarred the most, where we have suffered or have caused suffering. But by our scars, we become to one another what God is to us. The embodiment of justice, mercy, peace, hope, and joy. The subtitle to Henry Nouwen's book, The Wounded Healer, is this. In our own woundedness, we can become a source of life for others. You've got scars. Perhaps you're covered with wounds and some scars are still forming. Certainly not that we should be proud of our scars, but we shouldn't be embarrassed by them either. More than anything, we should be willing to tell their stories. I've always believed in the power of story. And I certainly believe in the power of the resurrection of Christ that has the power to turn our scars into stories of hope and new life. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Resurrected Jesus, from the view we have, our pain and struggles often seem without meaning. Lord, be our courage and strength. Bring us to a place where the pain eases and rejoicing begins, to a place where we can share our story. Remind us of your hope in the wounds that heal and leave a scar, a scar that will give us a story to bring to the nations and to tell of your great redeeming love. In the name of Jesus our risen and living Savior. Amen. This is a day.
invite you to join me in prayer, both spoken and unspoken, as we lift our hearts to God. God of wonder and strength, as the sun breaks forth new life every morning, Jesus rose from the dead and renews our lives every day. Though we have been wounded in our bodies and in our hearts, through Christ you heal them into scars that testify hope and transformation. Therefore, today we thank you for the good gifts of new life, the love of family and friends, the reconciliation among those who are estranged, for babies newly born, and for those who now rest in the next life with you, for the awe-inspiring natural world that you created, for the ways that Christian disciples are quietly but persistently modeling your love, concern, and acceptance for those who feel lost, lonely, and left out for new opportunities to use our talents and gifts to contribute to the peaceable kingdom of your reign, for those who send us every day, who need from us the love and welcome you give us. God of eternity, the Easter story reminds us that you have never abandoned us. Though we bear the wounds of grief, fear, and alienation, you offer the balm of forgiveness and the embrace of grace. We pray for those who are hurting or anxious, those who are sick or in trouble, those who grieve, those who suffer from poverty, hunger, and homelessness, victims of physical and emotional violence, the world's leaders and their responsibility to pursue peace in the common good, and the church's leaders, that they would bring wisdom and calm in a time of transition and uncertainty. We humbly ask that you hear our spoken and unspoken concerns and joys. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This month, United Methodists across the nation are celebrating Native American Ministries Sunday. This church-wide special Sunday reminds us of the gifts and contributions that Native Americans make to our society. The special offering supports United Methodist Ministries with Native Americans and scholarships for Native American seminarians. Your generosity helps your church continue as a vital beacon of God's love to your surrounding community. It also helps others in our conference and around the world to experience and grow in God's grace. Indeed, we are not alone. We are better together. I invite you to make a gift through your church to the Native American Ministries offering, in addition to supporting the important ministries of your church. Our next hymn for today is Sing with All Saints in the Glory.
May the love of God who created us, the peace of Jesus Christ who heals us, and the strength of the Holy Spirit who emboldens us to love others grant you faith, trust, and hope. Go now as those who bear scars that tell a story to bring the story of God's love and healing to all you encounter. Thanks be to God. Amen.